This morning on the show, we're joined by Mr. Loki Abeng, who is a climate justice lead researcher to talk about the challenges of flooding and ways to mitigate it in an era of climate change. Hello, Mr. Loki. Good morning to you. Thank you. Um, good morning. And um, I'm happy to be here this morning. Now, let's talk climate change in the perspective of Nigeria's contribution towards global warming. We're told by the statistics that we contribute more or less a minute quota unlike other industrialized nations of the world. And putting that in mind, especially in light of the recent floods in Meduguri, Borno State, is the challenge with the report as to what cost it. Some sections of publications on the media are saying it is climate change. Others are faulting the Alawa Dam. That would be a good place to start. From your research, could you help tell us what might have caused the situation we're seeing in Borno State? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's an interesting question and uh, I think it gives me uh, such pleasure and excitement to always have the opportunity to talk about climate change. Uh, from your introduction, uh, you said uh, we are less responsible uh, for some of the factors responsible for climate change, which is um, from so, some research um, outlet you will hear that um, Africa contribute less than 4%. And as a climate justice research lead, I, I think that particular narrative is making us feel too relaxed, that we don't have a part to play um, those who are majorly responsible, the ones emitting over 95% should take responsibility. But we can see with the recent flooding, and not just flooding, you also have issues of drought, uh, which is affecting our food security. Uh, let me just put it here. I recently returned from um, an official trip in Adamawa Yola. Um, coincidentally, that trip happened at the time when the Yobe flood or the Meduguri flood um, was all over the news. There are a lot of factors responsible for, for flooding. Some persons are saying, oh, it's the, the, the dam that um, uh, broke. Some other persons are saying, oh, it is climate change. Both answers are correct. Um, the dam is responsible, which plays the, the role of infrastructure deficit that we have. But also what caused it is um, high level of water rise. And, and you know people have been saying there's the melting of the glacier ice and all not what um, that could be responsible. But majorly, um, you could trace the factors of flooding in Nigeria to climate change. We now have more waters than we used to have five years ago or we used to have 10 years ago. And if you look at the issue of flooding in itself, um, 10 years ago, it wasn't as prominent as we are discussing it today. And that could be traced to climate change. Um, the, the, the climate is changing. There are factors responsible for it. Um, um, and all I can say right now is it is high time we begin to put in more conversations, these issues out there so everybody can see the role that they play. Of course, Nigeria is a party to um, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the UNFCCC. We have ratified that um, particular treaty. We have developed what we call our national commitment, which is supposed to be our own contribution to reducing some of this effect of climate change that we're seeing. But I, I want to believe that as this conversation goes on, we'll look at some of those um, uh, framework. Well, we must appreciate you for giving us a background and putting in the perspectives of our role to play, despite the fact that Africa as a whole, 4%, we should not renege on the efforts that need to be put on the table. Now, with the challenge on how we respond to disasters, in line with the changes in our climate and the evidence in the flooded communities is a case study in Borno State. We must thank the government of the day and well-meaning Nigerians. We hear that over 11 billion naira has been donated so far. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, but people ask the question of what happened to the over 400 billion naira ecological fund that was on ground to also in some way bring about a level of investments and actions towards averting such natural disasters. Well, uh, that's a question of accountability that you've just raised there. Um, we know that there are supposed to be effort, but let's even wind back to the beginning of 2024. Um, there were um, annual flood outlook that was given by um, the Nigerian Hydrological Services Agency. And we also had, um, we also had other international organizations who were also interested in the issue of flooding, and then they also gave their own prediction. Um, if you want to sum it up, the prediction for 2024 says 31 out of the 36 states are flood high risk state. Now the next questions we've been asking 
um, as concerned stakeholders is how well were these um, risks communicated to this high risk state? Were the assessment just left at the federal level or at the national level? Then if you now go to mitigating some of this um, flood that you've just asked, ecological funds, and um, we've also heard um, from different outlets, um, the United Nations donating, the likes of Dangote, and other philanthropical gestures uh, have, have come up. The question is how effective have we been using um, intervention fund in the last, let, let me even put in the last five years. Because as a whole, if you look at our our uh, NDC, the National National Determined Contribution, we had said this is our NDC and this is what it will cost. Uh, I think over over eighty billion USD uh, is what the, the the government has said will be will be needing to even meet the target in our NDCs to say oh this our this is Nigeria's contribution to reducing emission or to tackling climate change. If you look at the twenty twenty four budget that we had. And my organization and a couple of other organizations have sat down to, to really do an assessment of how climate responsive uh, the particular budget for 2024 is. We found a lot of shortfalls and gaps. Some of these gaps never even responded to the issue of climate change. What we saw, um, we had um, our budget were, respons were responsive to solar lights, solar light, almost every ministry, department, and agencies, even in the outlook that all um, agencies had given flood outlook and I, i'm also worried because we are only looking at meduguri but the outlook said 31 states, states. but we're only looking at meduguri um in some patches um yobe while i was in adamawa i had to talk to communities as well how are they preparing for the flood and they said we are just at the mercy of whatever would happen by the time cameroon open their dam as well. We're probably going to see same issue or same circumstances that we've seen in Meiduguri. So how responsive are our ecological fund? That is another question that begs for some form of assessment as well. Looking back at how has it been responsive in the last five years and how do citizens, uh, are citizens even aware that there's even an ecological fund and how can they even assess these ecological funds? and what areas are these funds supposed to respond to. Uh, we are begin, uh, in, for us as an organization, we are still trying to do an assessment of what has come in and also ask government the question of accountability. How are you going to use um, this fund and how are the people, the frontline communities going to benefit from, from, the fund. from some of this, uh, this fund? These questions, um, I do not have answers to them. Um, we'll be going back to see how we can carry out an assessment and hope that government will be responsive to some of our questions. That will be asking them now another challenge which we also discussed over the course of the week in light of this occurrences is a situation in bielsa state as well largely a coastal community and many keep asking much like you cited the lagdo dam is about to be released from cameroon there had been budgets in previous administrations it is an issue of perennial flooding so one would think that in the dry season the government needs to embark on some of those counter dam projects which we're much advised by organizations much like yourself, but it seems as though there is a miscommunication gap. Is it that the investments are not on hand or the project has been abandoned? Uh, <laughs> this, this, these questions are, are really interesting questions. Um, we, ha we have a lot of abandoned projects. First of all, we, we have to um, um, settle that. And there are lots of, just like I cited um, when I appeared on one of the media houses in April to also look at the issue of flooding. You only have this communication at the national level and the issue of um, be it mitigation or responding to disaster risk reduction as the case may be, it has to be inclusive. So when we are done with, with the flood season and then we count our losses, we go back home and wait for the next season for the same thing to happen. No proactive step, um, no inclusion in terms of designing disaster risk measures that could be beneficial to communities. I think there are, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of um, ways we can avert some of this um, 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 climate change impact that we are seeing with us today. But um, I'm sad to say that from 2022, when we had to 
COP27 in Egypt. That was in November. By October, we saw one of the worst flooding in Nigeria, uh, where we lost over 600 lives. Between 2022 down to now that we are in 2024, we have carried out an assessment to look at the responsiveness of government to um, climate change disaster, our focus on flooding. But we have not been able to cite any tangible response from government in terms of solution. We just have this culture of every year it happens and then we say, oh, there's flooding. And then we tie it to climate change and then we go back to our shelves and then we wait for the next cycle. The issue of biosa that you have just um, cited is a riverine community. And like we said, we are beginning to see sea level rise. Communities are being lost every year. Um, the, the land size is shrinking. The water is coming back today. But there have been no, we've not seen any tangible response from government. And I think that it is high time we begin to go back to the dashboard. Interestingly, we are beginning to revise our, um, we are in the third circle of revising our national determined contributions. And these are some very tangible evidence that we need to bring to the table to make our response measures and our contributions more ambitious. Because I think over time, we have just been running with the, the template that have been given to us by, by either the UNFCCC or even conversations from the regional level, um, be the African group of negotiators and some other bodies that, that we have. But we're beginning to see reasons why we now need to bring community voices, listen to them, and also they hold some form of solutions to some of these um, issues that we are, that we are that we are facing today, uh, being being climate change. Now, this issue of climate change is multifaceted. One of the most prominent indicators is the flood we're experiencing, and it's worthy of note that the flood we're experiencing has a lot of impact on both the environment, our livelihoods, and even the people. So let's talk about some of these impacts. Let's start with the impacts on environment, be it the destruction of settlements and forcing people in, into IDB camps, and more prominently the issue of food security. Mm -hmm. These two issues seem to be an issue we keep discussing all year round, and uh, the government of the day credit to them always responds by donations, donations. Are there other ways we can explore other alternatives towards addressing environmental impact issues and food security issues? Yes. Interestingly, there are, there are a lot of ways we can address this um, from investing in infrastructure is one. Um, but I'm more interested in um, what I call mindset shift. Because we also, um, we have human factors to some of these things. Uh, a clear example, if we look at how we, we plan our development uh, as well, um, we tend to even build houses um, and structures around way, pathways where we're supposed to be reserved for um, waterways, for water to flow. That is one. But to respond to um, the issue of the question, its impact on the environment and, and food security. The impact on the environment, one, you see how it affects, flooding affects health systems. Um, we're beginning to see the issue of MPOX and also cholera. Um, there's going to be an increase of cholera outbreak because these are um, waterborne, diseases. waterborne diseases, you know. And it then becomes the question of how responsive are our health system as well to these diseases that would be uh, increased by, 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 by the issue of flood. Then to the issue of food security, you need to see the impact of this flood in, and most of, of course, you know, the Northeast region, uh, we, we, we know them for, for farming. And when I was in Adamawa, I visited a couple of rice farms waiting to be flooded from the, the, the river Benue that is going to overflow through, through, through Yola. And we also saw um, the one in Yobe as well. We have some, from, some good um, rice field as well in Yobe that have been flooded. I'm from Cross River State. And we are known to also be good in farming yam and cassava. These lands, farmlands, are being flooded as well. So I'm afraid for 2025, or even starting from 2024, because we are going to see huge um, um, losses uh, from the side of farmers. And then in terms of environment, back to environment, 
Um, you have personal belongings, houses, structures that are going to be lost to this flooding. And there are no response uh, measures on ground to say um, uh, this is where you can, you can run to. You, you raised the issue of the IDP camp. At COP28 in Dubai, um, there was the historic um, agreement to establish and operationalize the loss and damage fund. Uh, and we saw commitment of over $700 million uh, committed to, to that fund. Then how many community, frontline communities are even aware that there's even something called the L&D fund and what really constitute losses and what really constitute damages? These are some conversations that are still ongoing and probably some mechanism that we can have to um, caution the effect flooding is going to have on our food security and also on, on the environment. Now, let's talk about its effects on livelihoods and the people. Now, owing to publications, we saw the death toll currently made degree pegged above over 37 persons. We're told that 300 children are cramped in 26 IDP camps. Now, parents of those children, many of whom cannot go back to work owing to the impacts of the flood, are also lamenting malnutrition on the part of the children. Yeah. In assessing this impacts on livelihood and the people, what would be some of the solutions you're looking to prefer? Well, uh, the, the, uh, my solution has always been, and I think in terms of assessing the level of damage, um, the, the numbers are still on the increase. I, I spoke with a contact in, in Yobe yesterday, and there are families who are still saying that they can't find their kids. Um, some persons are still missing and, and all. I think it's high time. I've always advocated that we have to have an inclusive disaster risk um, uh, management planning. Um, and this is where you consider everybody as a stakeholder. For people who might be in, 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 in states that are not, um, uh, are not flagged as high-risk states, they might not consider themselves as, 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 as people who are prone to some of these. But for, for the region that we have seen, so one of the solutions would be to have an open dialogue to design clearly defined disaster risk management plan where everybody sees their role and everybody also have access to support mechanism in terms of financing that, 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 that we have. Livelihood as a whole, livelihood as, as a whole uh, for, for, flo for flood prone areas, uh, I don't think we've really done a clear assessment of the level of damages flood flooding has done to livelihood of um, of um, frontline communities. So we still have frameworks that probably are outdated and are not as responsive as they ought to to be. And um, what we are trying to do, I think, before going to uh, COP29 in, in Baku, uh, my organization and a couple of other um, like-minded partners have decided to, to have um, a couple of roundtable discussion to look at solutions that are responsive to some of the challenges of climate change that we are seeing today. And I think by the end of the dialogue that we will be organizing, we can come up with some clear-cut um, solutions that can be recommended to government as well. And we hope that the government will be open to adopting some of the measures and we want to see them reflecting in our revised NDC that we are bringing in 2025. Now, it's important at this point of our discussion to highlight some of the key metrics as provided by the National Emergency Operations Center. And uh, talking about some of the key metrics of the 2024 flood incidents that have been tagged pre dam crisis, we're told that sadly 29 states have been affected out of the 31, as rightly pointed out by Mr. Loki Abeng. 137 local government areas largely affected as well. Now, in terms of the demographics of persons affected, we're told that 809,312 persons have been affected, out of which 386,239 have been displaced. 2,390 persons sustained injury as a result of the impacts of flood. Now, in terms of impacts on the environment, 125,805 hectares of farmland have been so far submerged. 94,491 houses have been affected. And the death toll 
owing to flood mm-hmm. since the start of the year is currently at 229 lives lost now this is some sad indications as to where we're headed now and in terms of uh, the amount of land space we're told that currently Meduguri is the case study where 70 percent of Meduguri was submerged starting to on to the start of the floods there have also been alerts on how much security the waters would face with uh, some wild animals at large the likes of crocodiles at large as well owing to reports and publications as captured on the dailies earlier uh, a correctional facility in borno state was also affected escaped inmates also on the on the on the on the, on the run but the challenge now is with the demographics of vulnerable children now we hear the 300 children in idp camps you talked about the likes of mpox and cholera which are some of the diseases that we're going to have to combat with we've seen aids coming in from the likes of unicef and whatnot but but i'm just suggesting i don't know if it's viable in terms of those who are being relocated do you think that the children families with children can be given some sort of priority in order to more like shelter them from the harsh impacts of this projected disease outbreaks well uh we've always um had that narrative that climate change um, affect women and girls more um, unfortunately what we are seeing now will only just increase um, the rate of out of school children um, because the, the place of learning are also been affected uh priority of course had to be given to um, um women and children more because for children their immune system um, are not as responsive um, um, to, to that of adult but the the, the question is um, from the assessment I've, I've, also, I've already done in 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 Adamawa the the health systems are overwhelmed um, I, I did had um, interview sessions with IDP camps as well who also confirm that uh, there are also rec- uh, medical aid that they would need that their health centers don't even have. So we're, we're, we're also seeing that the flood issue has also already caused some, has stretched what we can really accommodate um, in terms of responding. And this is where um, there's also that need for increased capacity building, increased manpower. Uh, so I, I, I can't really speak to the level of aid that um, we've received so far uh, from UNICEF and, and the rest. But we also need to now understand um, that the issue of bureaucracy in terms of releasing this aid um, need to be out of the way as well because these are some of the issues that were raised while I was in Adamawa as well. I mean, in order to save, to save more lives. But I think the situation is really, really sad. Now, the final angle in closing would be in terms of ensuring there is transparency despite this goodwill by well, many well-meaning Nigerians and also foreign partners. Does your organization do some level of monitoring or are there other organizations, to your knowledge, that would follow this disbursements and keep their eyes on the money to ensure that those who are to benefit from this monies are the actual persons benefiting? Well, uh, first of all, my organization, um, we do not... Um um, follow the money, the climate change money, uh, as the case may be. But I think that is um, an interesting angle um, for stakeholders to to, to look at. Uh, we do have a couple of organizations who uh, just on the general follow budget. But I think it's high time we begin to um, encourage such organizations because uh, what we have understood over time is when it comes to the issue of climate change, um, organizations tend to leave it to some other organizations they feel are in the field of climate change. But if, with the issue of the flooding now, you can see that it affects everybody. And we are calling on the government to allow um, civil society organizations to be part of the response measures um, in terms of uh, aid, support, distribution, and, and all. But I think um, with what we have we are hearing so far the aid donation that is coming in. It calls for some form of interest in terms of transparency. And we look forward to um, working with organizations like some that I, I said we, we know to, to put our eyes and ensure that um, this aid really gets to those who are needing it. And I think it is high time the government of Nigeria also consider um, 
exploring the option of a loss and damage fund. Um, that is one of the viable funds that we can really assess um, to respond to some of the climate change disaster that we are seeing in, in, in Nigeria today. Well, if you just tune in, you're watching ADBN television and we're discussing ways to address flooding challenges in an era of climate change. I'm in the studio with Mr. Loki Abeng, who is a climate justice lead researcher. And we've highlighted some of the impacts on the environment, on livelihoods and on the people, as well, on, as, well as on projections of the level of food security. While he has noted that he's been in touch with some of the persons in IDP camps, he has also highlighted challenges with the medical strength being overwhelmed. Well, we'll take a break and when we return, we'll look at some of the last minute interventions coming in in terms of a certain number of drums of chlorine that have been deployed to Meduguri and uh, some sensitizations of how persons can go about best sanitation and hygiene practices in order to avert the spread of diseases following the flooding of communities with over a million persons affected by the current floods. Do also stay with us. No matter what I see, enough it make mouth heavy to talk them. That's now why people they talk. You know what thing they worry you, but you know if you take help yourself. In this kind of situation now, what if they really no talk to her now? What if be the way forward? They go bury our chairman on Thursday. Mm. We go remain here. Make we talk good, where we they see good, and where we no say we not they see good, make we also they talk them. No woman, no mother desire to know the grave of his child. The bank manager and the bank executive, they are the one the government should first face. People They Talk, the show on Monday to Friday by 5 p.m. on top ADBN TV. In a world of overwhelming voices where everyone has different opinion on different issues, it is important that we bring the core issue to the fore. Join me, Nancy Bonigo, on Softline as we lend our voices to inform and influence your thoughts and actions. This is not just mere talk, it is an invocative program that touches the core of our existence. Now, with less than an hour to go, as we look to wrap up this conversation, a lot has been said, but we have two more issues to tackle. Whilst a lot of commendations has gone to Governor Baba Ghana Zulum in the handling of the floods in Borno State, there is some assertions that a bulk of the pressure in disaster management has been domiciled with the federal government. The states, in terms of their response and preparedness, seem to be found wanting. Do you think that there should have been more owing to the outlook, the times of... Uh, uh, alerts issued and even in the projections that 31 states should have begun to prepare for the imminent floods that we have witnessed. Uh, yes, um, I, I think um, I share in that sentiment as well that um, the pressure is um, heaped on the federal government. Um, I would always use Adamawa as my case study for discussion because while I was there, um, I also made effort to reach out to the State Emergency Management Agency, which is SEMA. Unfortunately, there was nobody on ground to, to also speak to me as at the time of my assessment. Um, they, they, they are, and we do have tons of civil society organizations who are based at the state level as well, who felt they have for too long been cut off from the conversation. And I, and I think this is the issue of capacity building. We do have lots of the conversation on, on the federal government, but when you look, state do have state commission of environment, they do have different um, disaster response um, agencies at the state level. Where have they been all this while, and what level of conversations and relationship have they also built with this community over over the years? So, and this is why um, for us, we have always been interested in decentralizing communication, mainstreaming frameworks to be respond subnational. Um, responsiveness to framework that, that we do have. So while we also put the torchlight on the federal government, and, and I think to do justice and also reach out and achieve climate justice of some sort, we do need to look at the role that state um, level platforms also need to play as stakeholders in the whole of 
this disaster uh, um, uh, management that we are, we are discussing today. Uh, interestingly, you might even go to state uh, media houses and not see the conversations as frequent as you see at the national level. So um, there is some level of advocacy and communication that state level needs to play. Because at the end of the day, when you meet frontline communities and ask them what is happening, they might not be able to explain it to you as, as perfect as you would, would want to. And that is because there's some level of capacity being and even engagement and advocacy and awareness that is missing. And I think um, state government have a, a huge role to play. Now, my final way. question of the day before we say our goodbyes, still on decentralizing approach. This morning, earlier reported on one of the dailies reviewed the New Telegraph, we learned that the federal government is deploying experts to test the waters. 100 drums of chlorine were sent to Meduguri. Uh, we hear about 30,000 flyers for information dissemination were also circulated. But the challenges on what best state approach can be used to create a level of awareness for sanitation and hygiene practices at a time of disaster like this in Borno State? Well, um, it's really shocking to even hear that um, we are deploring um, chlorine at this level to test. This is not the first flooding we're experiencing in Nigeria. So what that means is there ought to be some response measure, which is why I'm saying hammering on disaster risk um, reduction measures. There ought to be some response measures that ought to have been developed even when we had the 2022 flooding, which was one of the major highlights of flooding in Nigeria. And then we had last year and then we are having this year as well. So I think we sometimes are taking responses uh, quite too late. We ought to have done this uh, uh, before now. So it then beckons on our, um, it then raised the question of how prepared we are because we just wait for these things and sometimes we say it's a nat natural disaster. Even though you might want to have this as a natural disaster, there is a role that we ought to have played to have reduced its impact um, on 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 our livelihood so i think going forward um, we need to invest heavily on um, on our response measures and uh, understand in terms of communicating this this um, 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 issues of climate change that we're having decentralizing um, um, the framework that we already have and then capacity building there's a whole lot of gaps in terms of communicating this disaster and investing in capacity building, harnessing indigenous knowledge as well um, would be key because at the end of the day, when you try to evacuate people, um, they tend to be reluctant in leaving because this um, is their ancestral home. Then you now need to have conversations with them of how the issue of flooding is not new but the thing is we are already seeing we are now seeing new dimensions to this flooding which then requires some form of um, additional scientific knowledge to to respond to these things but also enhancing the indigenous knowledge that we already have on ground and there is need to increase awareness there's the role of um, national orientation agency um, that they need to play and they need to now work with state uh, level orientation agencies, local level um, education and awareness agencies that we have to amplify these issues and then listen to communities what they think is the feedback. But also I think we now need to invest more on some of the solutions which include um, um, tree planting as well because our soil level are weak uh, as well as you can, as you can see. So there's, there's need for that aggressive tree planting. There's need for um, proper drainage um, systems that we, we need to revisit back our urban planning uh, a measure that we, we, we have and see where we have gaps and where we can really, really make them climate smart responsive because uh, some of the planning and frameworks that we have are outdated and need to be revised, review revised and probably updated to be able to um, um, meet up to some of the challenges that we're having today. Well, Mr. Loki, I must thank you for a very engaging conversation this morning. We thank do appreciate you, you. Thank you for having me.